Well, uh, you know, Democrats and Republicans aren't a category. The, the Republicans and Democrats differ, like on the rare occasions when I vote, and they're pretty rare. Uh, sometimes I vote for Democrats, sometimes for Republicans, sometimes for somebody else. Uh, it's, uh, it's not a sharp split. There are two factions of the same party. We have a one-party state with two somewhat different factions with a lot of overlap. Business party has a couple of factions. Uh, by and you find some differences between them. I wouldn't say there's no difference on the average. Uh, so uh, what should you do in that case? Well, like everything, it's your own choice. Do you want to live in a democratic society or do you want to live in the society we have? Uh, which, remember, is not a democratic society and is not intended to be. If you take a course in political theory here, I'm sure they'll teach you that the United States is not a democracy. It's what's called in the technical literature a polyarchy. Uh, that's the term invented by the leading democratic theorist, uh, Yale professor Robert Dahl. Uh, but the, the idea is old, very goes way back to James Madison and the foundation of the Constitution. A polyarchy is a system in which uh, power resides in the hands of those who Madison called the wealth of the nation, the responsible class of men, uh, and the rest of the population is fragmented, uh, distracted, uh, allowed to participate. Uh, every couple of years they're allowed to come and say, yes, uh, thank you, uh, why don't you continue for another four years? And they have a little choice among the responsible men, the, the uh, wealth of the nation. Now, that's the way the country was founded. It was founded on the principle explained by Madison and the Constitutional Convention uh, that uh, the primary goal of government is to protect the minority of the opulent against the majority. Uh, that's, and then the Constitution was designed to sort of ensure that. There's been a lot of struggle about it over the years. You know, a lot of victories have been won by the public, so it's not the same as it was two centuries ago. But that remains. It remains the elite ideal, and it's a constant struggle. Uh, and most of the population is well aware of it. Uh, so, for example, take the November 2000 election. Uh, there was a lot of, uh, among intellectuals, educated people, you know, university professors and people like that, uh, there was a great deal of uh, outrage about the stolen election and article after article about the Supreme Court shenanigans and uh, you know, Florida, this and that, and so on. Uh, if you read through that literature, which was vast, uh, you notice there's a constant refrain. Nobody can understand why the public didn't care. You know, the public is a game among intellectuals. The public just didn't care. So, okay, the election was stolen. Who cares? Uh, it was never an issue among the public. Uh, why wasn't it an issue? Well, you know, if you look at, uh, this is a very heavily, uh, the attitudes in the United States are very carefully monitored. Business wants to know what people are thinking. Uh, and in fact, uh, there, there is, for example, at Harvard, at uh, the Kennedy School of Government, a project called the Vanishing Voter Project, uh, where they uh, study closely the attitudes of people towards the government. Uh, it turns out on the eve of the election, so like before the election, you know, before Florida and the Supreme Court, about 75% of the population didn't think there was an election going on at all, at least as far as they were concerned. Uh, they, they, their attitude towards the thing happening was that it's some kind of a business with, uh, involving rich contributors, uh, political leaders, and the public relations industry. Uh, which is training candidates to say meaningless words that they don't understand uh, that they think will maybe pick up a few more votes. Well, that's only 75% of the public. Uh, so, of course, they didn't care very much, you know, if the Supreme Court uh, happened to hand it over to one of them rather than the other. Uh, in fact, uh, most people voted against their own interests and consciously because they knew it didn't matter much. Uh, the, they were supposed to vote on what are called qualities, not issues, like do you like the guy, you know, do you want to be with him or something like that, do you want to have a drink with him in a bar, you know, something like that. That was the issue in the election. Uh, people didn't even know where the candidates stood on issues. And it's not because they're stupid, it was extremely hard to figure out where they stood on issues. And that they're trained to make it hard. And in fact, most of the issues that the public cared about weren't even allowed to come up. So the major issues, if you look at public added concerns, 
the major issues have to do with economic affairs, uh, international economic affairs, what's misleadingly called globalization, and the trade deficit, and job security, and things like that. But none of that stuff came up. You, know, you can't bring those issues up in the elections. Uh, the, the, the free trade area of the Americas was coming up. There was going to be a summit of the Americas in a couple of months. Uh, issues on which the public has extremely strong opinions, but none of it could be brought up in the election, and for a very simple reason. Uh, if you take a look at attitudes, there's a very sharp split between elite opinion, which is strongly in favor of all of this stuff, and the public, which is strongly opposed to them, and therefore it can't come up in the election, uh, and didn't. Uh, these issues are unmentioned. Uh, virtually nobody knew that the free trade area of the Americas was coming along. Uh, so uh, what, about, what do you do? Well, you have to decide whether you want to live in a democratic society or not. If you want to live in the kind of society that, uh, say, Madison envisioned, uh, okay, that's a choice, uh, but it's certainly not necessary. Uh, over the last couple of hundred years, there has been a very substantial uh, uh, extension of the right of the population, of the uh, ability to uh, participate and make a difference. It's not overwhelming, and there's always a struggle to beat it back, uh, but uh, there's no reason why that can't continue. Uh, and that's the alternative. It's not a matter of naming one party or another, but just changing the whole framework in which politics persists, uh, largely because of the extremely narrow concentration of economic power, uh, which uh, uh, you know, removes from the public arena most decisions that belong there. And there's a major effort underway right now to re reduce it even further. Well, you don't have to accept this.